Good. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have the one and only Dom D. Augustino in the house. How are you doing this morning? Doing well. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned too, right before we hit the record button, uh, you said that you're at your campus right now um, in Florida. So it's, uh, what, what, remind me what the university is. Yeah, this is University of uh, South Florida. But okay. We're in Tampa. Yeah. In 1956, it was the southernmost university in Florida. So that's why people think I'm in Miami, but I'm in like actually in the middle, but it's University of South Florida. Gotcha. Yeah. And then we just like touched up on just like, you know, I asked if the, like, it's like a ghost town there, if there's going to be like, you know, students going back on campus and you said that nobody's there right now. So, I mean, just let, let's, let's touch up on that. I mean, it's just really interesting times right now with this whole coronavirus going on. So you as an educator, you know, tell me how you've, how you've had to adapt to this and more importantly, like the students as well too. Yeah. Uh, I guess it was February. Maybe we started thinking about, you know, this could potentially uh, push us to migrate. And, and, and in March, it became a reality that we started making transitions to migrate. Uh, I was teaching neuroscience and physiology and a couple other classes. And, uh, you know, the, the school made the decision, you know, as is every other school. I think maybe we're a little sooner to do it because things are getting pretty bad in our area. Uh, but, you know, online teaching has been... Uh, a really good adaptive process. I think it's been, it's good that we've all been able to adapt as faculty and the students love it actually. Like a third of them sometimes didn't come to class anyway because everything gets migrated onto Blackboard. Uh, although we try to encourage everybody to come to class all the time. Uh, but the thing that, you know, has really hurt us is like working in the lab, right? To be able to run experiments. We have government contracts with like the Navy and Department of Defense and various uh, businesses. We have, you know, uh, industry contracts and we can't, we don't have the manpower. We don't have the ability to, to get this research done. So we're just starting, you know, we're maintaining our animal colonies and things like that. And we're doing some things, but it's really stalled our research. And we're just trying to, you know, get back into the swing of things so we can get, you know, forward progress. In the meantime, we've been super productive in writing and just generating content for our science and analyzing data and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. that's re really interesting. I, I just can't imagine, you know, just having, having you go from so many years to just teaching and having students and the whole campus full. And then all of a sudden it's just like ghost town, like nobody's there, but I mean, it seems like you guys are making the best of the situation. Yeah, it's bizarre, you know, but I, I think we're kind of lucky in that, you know, as educators, classes will go on. And we're really lucky to have an online format where uh, a lot of the systems have migrated, you know, Zoom, but we use Microsoft Teams and, uh, you know, students can ask questions. I probably spend about twice the amount of time teaching as I normally do, mm -hmm. just because I have to maintain like office hours and do review sessions and things like that. But, uh, but I think that the students are doing just as well in all the, all the test material, you know, or better. So, so that's been really great to see that. And, you know, so I, I think we're in an okay position moving forward with education, but in regards to research, it, it's going to, we have some challenges ahead. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, Dom. So I really want to kind of kick this off with some fun and, and what we call rapid dynamic questions. You ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, so the first question is, Dom, uh, let, let's say there was, you know, a big billboard out there in Florida and this billboard basically granted you to say any message that you wanted on it. What would this billboard say and why? Uh, you know, everybody's like, go, go, go. And it seems like with COVID, uh, you know, things are actually more hectic. Uh, so I just kind of a mantra I say to myself is just be still. And I think, you know, I wake up and I look at my schedule and I do some spiritual things in, in the, in the beginning, but I always allocate time for, you know, constructive downtime, creative downtime. So I think like, you know, one of my spiritual mentors, actually Fred Hatfield, was uh, the late Fred Hatfield, he, he kind of used that phrase a lot, you know, Dominic, you just gotta like be still when I was right in the middle of, you know, my academic tenure process, so. Yeah. Gotcha. What's, what's, what's your go-to way to consume content? Is it audio, video, written? Uh, I do a lot of audio books. Uh, I do, I work on a farm a lot and we have a farm and I have to be on the tractor or kind of do, 
tasks where I can, you know, listen to something. And, uh, and usually like every four or five books that I listen to, I buy the actual book and then I, I take notes in it and read, but I read every day and I listen to audio books and podcasts pretty much every day. Nice. Uh, you know, most days. Yeah. What, what are you consuming right now? Audio wise? Uh, audio wise, I, uh, I just posted about this the other day and I just finished a book. It's called a short story of nearly everything. And it's just kind of, you know, from a, a, a scientific perspective, sort of like, you know, a discussion of everything <laughs> from the <laughs> origins of the universe to our, our human evolution. Uh, and, you know, I like a lot of podcasts like Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan and Peter Atia. It's more sciencey. I probably have about a half dozen podcasts I listen to. You guys are great too. From a business perspective, thank you. We are we've transitioned over the years to uh, to kind of move from just not only academic science but also creating a business platform and an informational platform. And I see you guys as great mentors in that space and the people that you have on too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And then um, also too, um, <clears throat> right now too, uh, like what is it that um, one or two books that somebody would would want, would read that was complete game changers that you read? Game changers. Well, everything is like uh, you know kind of specific. So if I go back, books that had like the greatest impact on me were uh, a book that a friend recommended, and it was called uh, Personal Power by Anthony Robbins. And I think I was only like 17 or 18 at the time. And, uh, and it had like a 30 day audio cassette. If you guys, you probably guys, you don't remember the audio cassette. Yeah, I heard about this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, and then the second book I bought was like Awaken the Giant Within. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was a, that was a really, uh, that actually made significant a major impact in my academic performance because it allowed me, I started journaling and writing things down. And once I started journaling and writing things down, uh, the, you know, the process of writing things down and, and hold and, you know, keeping my notebook with me all the day and it just highlighting the things that I would have to get done during the day, that just that simple thing made a huge difference right. in my life to be able to sit down and plan in the morning each day. And what I would do at, at night, I would kind of write out things at night and then revisit it in the morning. So I'd kind of be sleeping on it, you know, over the night. And that simple thing probably made the biggest impact in my life. You know, gotcha. Let's, let's finish this sentence. The fitness industry needs more of? Uh, I, it definitely needs, people need to support one another <laughs> instead of like, you know, attacking one another and kind of, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, they try to maybe build up their persona by attacking different ideas, whether that be, you know, a ketogenic diet or just, you know, a, a particular way of training. So uh, I tend to be kind of, I try to put out positive information and just try to be neutral against the things that I just think are, but I, th I think it's important to like call out BS when yeah. things are BS and it's hurting people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think uh, there needs to be an equal or more amount of uh, uh, significantly more amount of support for, for different ideas and things that, that people are promoting. So I think we just need more kind of people to help <laughs> yeah. support one another and, uh, and really try to grow our platforms by, you know, making it a positive experience for people to sort of visit whatever content we're putting out there. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And what, what do you currently fear right now the most? Uh, I mean, we definitely have some financial uncertainty uh, with sort of industry contracts. So we, some of the research that we do um, is funded by, by industry from different players in the market of ketogenic diets, therapeutic ketogenic diets, clinical. Uh, that and some of our government contracts, we do research with NASA and we're actually part of space analog missions where we're involved with like training astronauts or uh, going to uh, a particular location to vet out different procedures, technologies and processes for space missions. And that research, we are supposed to be doing it right now has been put on hold. So yeah, I'm really just, I'm kind of, 
scared about when will this research, because this is like what I do, this is what I'm known for, and this is how we make our living by generating data, you know, and then going from grant to grant. And the grants, the research grants support our lab and all my personnel that I have to pay salaries for. But if we can't do the research, that's, you know, it's, it's a, a big variable there. How are we going to move forward? Yeah. Gotcha. If there's any other, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, you have to be, you have to be. If there was, if there was any other profession that you could seek or just anything that you wanted else to do besides research, what would that be? Yeah, you know, I grew up on a farm, uh, just doing hard work and uh, bailing hay and from the age of like, (laughs) I don't know, 10, 11, 12. And then I got into working out. Uh, But I love I love nature. My wife and I like to be as close to, to nature as possible. We have a farm, we have dogs, we have cows, and uh, I spend a significant amount, amount of time doing that. And I like the science behind it. And I like sort of just being outside and working outside with my hands and learning different skills, you know, yeah. from agricultural to uh, animal husbandry to, you know, uh, maintenance of livestock and things like that. So probably transition to farming. Right on. That's really cool. All right, Dom. So you're officially off the hot seat so we can all breathe now. (laughs) But but Dom, I want to kickstart this whole entire discussion off of just kind of going back into your story, like really digging deep into the journey. That's what I really like to know, like the why behind what motivated people to get into their profession and their expertise. So I know that you're an associate professor at the University of South Florida. Like you said, you do a lot of research around the ketogenic diet, which we're going to definitely talk about in a little bit. But take us back in that moment when it was like that pivotal moment that you just knew, like that aha moment, if it was an epiphany where it's like, you know what, I have to go down this road to go and be an associate professor and even do like research, you know, to really help and make the world a better place. Can you kind of go back down that road? Yeah. Uh, well, I've always been into like fitness and nutrition and majored in it in undergrad, but I didn't really see a career that paid well, I guess. So I went into, I did my PhD in neuroscience. And after I finished that in 04, I was funded by the military to develop an anti-seizure strategy uh, to help Navy SEAL warfighters that use a closed circuit rebreather for their special operations uh, missions. And uh, so essentially I was looking for drugs that would, could, could prevent seizures. And in the process of investigating that and researching that, I found that the ketogenic diet was not a fad diet used in bodybuilding, but it was actually a medical diet that had been around for about a hundred years. So I gradually over the course of about two or three years transitioned away from drugs and focused more on the anti-seizure neuroprotective effects of the ketogenic diet. This is as I was going into a tenure track position. Some people thought it was academic suicide to like, you know, go away from, you know, uh, various new drugs that were coming on the market for this and to focus on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet just seemed kind of like snake oil. But, uh, but I, I saw that the data was pretty good in humans for a wide range of seizures. And, uh, and then I worked with uh, Patrick Arnold, uh, one of the chemists in the world, and he was able to develop some unique ketogenic compounds that actually could mimic the anti-seizure effect of the ketogenic diet. So once I saw these things actually working in the lab, I realized that I could build a research program on this and, uh, and worked really hard to do so and has been pretty successful with the uh, you know, Office of Navy Research who has like generously funded this work from the beginning and now we have a lot of different projects going on now. Right. And then was there anything like during like that, that journey where you're on that path, like they like just really kept you up at night or you're just maybe skeptical, like, man, am I really going down the right path? Is there something else that I should be doing? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't like really a traditional route that I was going because I was uh, investigating something that was not, it wasn't, it was totally new, like looking at a synthetic ketone molecule as an anti, there was a risk in doing that. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually know if the path I was going on was going to be sufficient enough for me to get like tenure at the university and if you don't get tenure basically you have to pack your bags and go and find it you know find another place so the clock was ticking because you typically just get like five years to do this and the clock started as soon as I started writing grants for this ketogenic strategy that was going to be the the cornerstone of my whole uh you know my, my whole 
you know, research program. And I would have to recruit students under me and then they'd be, P they'd be doing their PhD projects on this. And if that failed, then I'd be responsible for, you know, the, the dissertation research of PhD students and research associates. So, uh, but I had, I had pretty good faith it would work to at least as good as some of the drugs I was, I was researching. But there's, I had quite a bit of doubt, but enough faith to carry me through, I think. Right. And then what's been like, 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 I mean, like with, with everything in life, right? We're always trying, when we're trying to pursue something, a goal, a vision, there's always going to be some sort of obstacle that comes our way. So what was the biggest obstacle that came your way in this whole pursuit? You know, I, I'm pretty lucky in that uh, I didn't really face, like I hear, you know, a lot of people have different obstacles and uh, funding has always been a challenge and, and that kind of keeps me up at night. If I lose my grants, how am I going to pay? I worry about more like paying my employees and stuff because I feel right. like, you know, I can kind of make, make do with what I have here. Uh, but uh, the biggest obstacle was really maybe changing the culture of how we perceive nutrition as uh, a metabolic therapy. And that would be not only for seizures because I branched into studying cancer. And whenever you talk about diet and cancer management, then people think immediately, this is snake oil. This is, uh, we actually, you know, we, we focus on the ketogenic diet as an adjuvant to, to other forms of cancer therapy, like standard of care. And it made sense to go into that direction, which I got the most pushback on. Uh, but I went towards brain cancer because a consequence of brain cancer is seizures. And these are drug-resistant seizures. So it made sense to me to actually put patients on a ketogenic diet if they have brain tumors because the anti-seizure medication was really you know, decreasing the quality of life. Uh, so there was a little bit of pushback from that community about 10 or 12 years ago. But, and there was no clinical trials, but now we have 35 or 40, you know, registered clinical trials on this. And I feel like the research that we did in animal model research inspired a number of, uh, and my colleague Thomas Seyfried and uh, Adrian Sheck uh, and, and a number of others uh, did a lot of this research that have inspired the current, you know, clinical. But that has, I've probably gotten the most criticism and pushback from going into the direction of using nutrition uh, for as a cancer therapy. But again, like I'm pure, purely academic and actually kind of approaching this just as an adjuvant to other forms of care therapy to enhance or augment other forms of therapy. Uh, but I did get quite a bit of criticism and uh, pushback from, and still do, but less now because there's more science to support what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for sharing that because I mean, there, there, there has to be something, you know, to where you're going to get some sort of pushback or just how do you make yeah. the, how do you, how do you get people to really believe in, you know, all this research, the concepts and all that. So like, how did you deal with that? Like when you were getting criticism, when people were just saying, oh, this is like, you know, something that I can't, you know, take for, for, you know, real, like, what did you do to reframe your mindset and just be like, you know what, I'm going to block out all this noise. Like, this is what I believe in and just keep going. Yeah, you know, I, as scientists, I have to stick very close to the science. So I typically don't speak too much beyond the peer-reviewed pub published research. And that's kind of what I have to do, you know, for my job. Uh, although sometimes I believe in it a little bit more than, than the science. Uh, but I, I guess where it hurts me that, that some people take the research that we do and they sensationalize it or they, they extrapolate upon the findings. And because my name is associated with that research, it comes back to me like, you know, and, and in some situations that, uh, you know, people were saying that you should do away with the standard of care and just do a ketogenic diet. But in no cases do I know of that would a ketogenic diet cure cancer. So, and we, and even our lab never uses the ketogenic diet as a standalone therapy. We always use it in the context of another form of therapy. Like we've done hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We do drug research too. Uh, we do combination therapies. Uh, we work with Moffitt Cancer Center, who is basically just completely standard of care, but they're adopting this approach in some of the patients with a focus on brain tumor patients. So, uh, you know, how I, how I, you know, deal with it is that I just kind of, I dig my heels in and just kind of stick to the science and use that as a foundation. And we're not really going to get anywhere unless 
you know, this process is very incremental. And if you just, if you get experimental results and jump to uh, the conclusion that this needs to be used above all other forms of therapy, then that's not a very smart thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, so I try, I try to uh, kind of view things as let's take incremental approaches as the data accumulates to support this as a viable uh, therapy that people can do for certain forms of cancer. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dig into this, Dom, about kind of like the ketogenic diet and uh, your guys' labs, um, you know, results, because I know you guys have been doing this for 10 years now, you know, so I want to dig into this because, you know, we do have some, some health and fitness advocates listening to this and then also fitness professionals that we work with right now, you know, so they can better serve their clients if that's a nutrition concept they want to use, you know, with their clients, with the keto diet. So um, like just what would have been some of the biggest breakthroughs the past 10 years? Like your, your, your lab and research has kind of shown like in a, in a physical performance standpoint and maybe just health and metabolic standpoint. Yeah. Uh, what we see consistently is that with a ketogenic diet and uh, a lot of research that we do, it's not necessarily the diet, but developing novel forms of ketone supplementation that can produce what we call hyperketonemia. So elevate the ketones in the bloodstream. And by virtue of shifting the body's metabolic physiology, you can change brain energy metabolism and the neuropharmacology of the brain in a way that has an anti-seizure effect. So that can work for oxygen toxicity seizures, which I study in the context of diving, uh, something called Angelman syndrome, which we have a, a registered clinical trial for now, and we're investigating things like glucose transporter deficiency syndrome and other things that you guys may have not heard about that are neurometabolic diseases where the brain is just not getting the energy that it needs. So I think, I mean, that's really like a breakthrough from my perspective because the ketogenic diet, it's a standard of care for a number of neurometabolic diseases. And some patients are unwilling or unable to follow this kind of diet. So a supplement that can elevate this metabolic substrate and supply it to the brain uh, would dramatically change the quality of life. So that has probably been our main focus. And in the context of cancer, uh, it can have a muscle sparing effect or an anti-catabolic effect. Mm -hmm. And that may jump over to the world of uh, fitness and performance because when you're in a state of metabolic or called physiological ketosis, uh, different from diabetic ketoacidosis, which is results from an absence of insulin. When you're on a ketogenic diet, I think a ketogenic diet would be appropriate, maybe not ideal, it depends on the person, but if you're in a calorie deficit, the elevation of ketones when you're in a calorie deficit can be beneficial from a brain energy metabolism perspective and also from an anti-catabolic perspective. Because from an evolutionary standpoint, the reason why we can fast and not catabolize all our skeletal muscle is that the fatty acid oxidation in the liver produces these ketone bodies, which uh, are elevated higher on a ketogenic diet, and they have signaling properties, but they have anti-catabolic effects and, help, and can help spare gluconeogenic amino acids in the skeletal muscle. So uh, I think there's a pretty good rationale for that, and I think uh, when it comes to the world of fitness and performance, I think where the ketogenic diet could shine is in the context of body body recomposition. You know, if you if you go on a fat loss diet and you want to get lean and cut, you have to cut your calories. Like there's no way around it. And if you if you go into a calorie deficit and your ketone bodies are elevated, I think you'll have an advantage from. Uh, a neurobiology perspective in that your brain will be happier because it won't have to deal with uh, significant fluctuations in the glucose level. So you could actually go mildly hypoglycemic and if your ketones are elevated, that would be imperceptible. So, uh, so that, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think that's, that's pretty significant. And I, I experienced that when I started tinkering with the ketogenic diet you know, when you do research on something, you just kind of want to experience it too. Mm -hmm. And I kind of noticed that effect that uh, it was easier to be in a calorie deficit on a ketogenic diet than in, with a carbohydrate-based diet, for sure. 
Yeah. And that, that's kind of what I was going to ask my follow-up is like, is, is this, I know you practice and preach this and you've, you've tested it, but I was going to say, do you follow a keto, ketogenic diet like all year round? Or just like you said, just like when you're, when you're looking to, you know, shed some fat and just be in a calorie deficit. Yeah, I, I follow low carb for sure. And then uh, on some days I will be, you know, more ketogenic than other days. And uh, last month, every month I do like a fasting experiment. And last month it was just like three days. And uh, I kind of, I try to assess how that affects my thinking and how it even affects my performance. And now uh, I wear a continuous glucose monitor mm. where I can evaluate different diets and different supplements. I can evaluate the effect of stress, uh, different macronutrient ratios, uh, different supplements, whether it's a ketone supplement or even a carbohydrate supplement, how that impacts my blood glucose and the area under the curve. And I also measure insulin in response to uh, different dietary patterns or different supplements to determine how insulin is changing. Uh, and also it's interesting to see how exercise affects your glucose levels too. I mean, type two diabetes is a tremendous problem and there are simple things that we could do this morning we sent out a newsletter and it was my t continuous glucose monitor data showing after I ate a like 1500 calorie meal, I went for a short 30 minute walk and that kind of completely abolished the postprandial spike in glucose because the protein content was pretty high. It was like 75 grams of protein. Uh, and, and just simply going for a walk after meals can make a tremendous difference yeah. on glycemic variability. So I love to do like experiments like this. And I like, you know, even if we're not doing them in the lab, I'm always doing something on myself. And I try to do things that have actionable takeaways. Like after I do it and I do it a couple of times, I could validate it, put the data together and put it out in a newsletter or a blog and it can help somebody like this. Yeah. See, and, now. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I love that. Thanks for sharing that too. And I just, I really like how you're, you're really observant and you just like keep the data and you make these observations. Like, how am I feeling? How's like my brain feeling? How am I thinking? And I don't think enough people do that, right? They, they just hear like these trends and concepts when it comes to nutrition, just like, Oh, keto, paleo, just macros. And they, they do it for a couple of weeks and they're just like, Oh, I, I can't sustain this, this ketogenic diet, but it's like, they're not even paying attention to how they're performing. Just like little things, habits, just rituals, and just how it's just making them operate and perform like in different ways. So that's where I'm just like, you know, there's gotta be a little bit more, you know, for people just to buy into this. <laughs> yeah. I think the farther you get along, like you guys have been in this game for a long time. You're super fit. You're at the top of the, you're like elite level fitness. So you start to understand this a little bit more than maybe new people mm -hmm. jumping onto something. Uh, what I've experienced too is that when I'm in a fasted state uh, or even a calorie deficit, like if I'm dieting, my body becomes very sensitive to the food and the things that I put in from caffeine to carbohydrates to you know training adaptations and stuff. And you become more perceptive and, uh, and just introspective of the of how things are affecting you. And I think, you know, I, I realized early on that the more I understood it and analyzed it, the more I could leverage that knowledge to bring my body where it wanted to, where I wanted it to go, whether that could be a fat loss, whether it could be a bulking period, or it could be, uh, I was mostly always focused in strength uh, and really using that information to help incrementally increase my powerlifting strength over time. Yeah, absolutely. And just even given, oh, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, like, how come you think, Dom, just that, like, when people get into just, like, their health and fitness journey or health and wellness, whatever you want to call it, you know, that the popular media kind of takes over, even social media these days, too. It just takes over um, everything that they, the, the research points out, and it's, like, almost, like, abstract kind of, like, conclusions, and then they'll sit there and put that into practice, and they'll sit there and just be like, oh, you know, like, I'm only going to do, like, a ketogenic diet. I'm only going to do intermittent fasting diet. I'm only going to count macros. It's almost like they're married to it, and it's, if like, if they break that law of, like, intertwining different concepts like the the uh, nutrition police is going to come and put them in jail or something like that like why do you think that is you know with all of these trendy nutrition fads and, and, and concepts well people are looking for a quick fix and i think you just really have to go back to the basics and uh you know i always keep my metabolic physiology you know nutrition textbook nutrition you know, that stuff is still relevant where maybe a lot of ketogenic diet practitioners will be like, forget everything you know about nutrition 
and just listen to what I'm going to tell you. You know, eliminate carbs and you're going to feel better. So, uh, so I'm, I'm still kind of a, a core sort of foundational person and a little more conventional. Uh, and I just view the ketogenic diet, low carb, intermittent fasting as tools that people can leverage uh, to get them where they want to be. And they shouldn't, probably not a good idea to be on a ketogenic diet all the time. Uh, although I kind of am and I feel, I'm also a researcher, so I have to understand uh, I have to understand it from different perspectives. So I'm constantly researching on myself. Um, but it is just a tool and it may be very effective for some people. It's interesting that the people who are most interested in the ketogenic diet are the people who need it the least. <laughs> so if you are a fit athlete, your carbohydrate tolerance is probably fantastic and you could probably do really well on carbohydrates. But if you are an insulin uh you know, someone who's very insulin resistant and someone who's obese and have type 2 diabetes, I believe that, you know, the ketogenic diet uh, or just not even a ketogenic diet, just carbohydrate restriction is probably the most powerful tool that I can think of, more powerful than drugs, to really decrease glycemic variability and to get all your metabolic biomarkers uh, into a healthy range. There's nothing better than uh, carbohydrate restriction. I mean, you could achieve it with calorie restriction, but I believe the person will be more hungry along the way, and they're still going to have glycemic fluctuations uh, that can be significantly attenuated if you do a low carb approach. Uh, so, you know, I study the context from uh, seizures and cancer, but we're also do quite a bit of research and published on the glucose lowering effect of a ketogenic diet, but also just ketones themselves. If you take ketones orally, and this is like a new finding, we don't know the reasons why, but it can lower your blood glucose level. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the biggest therapeutic applications of what we have discovered so far, is that you can actually lower your blood glucose by consuming ketone supplementation. And so we're putting a lot of time and effort into understanding that. And I don't talk about it a whole lot because I don't understand it. If, if, uh, it's probably doing a number of things, insulin sensitivity, hepatic glucose output, and, and maybe uh, causing a small release of insulin that could facilitate glucose disposal, and probably a combination of things. Yeah, it's super interesting. So what would you say too? like, what is the, the big end goal, you know, with this, with all your research that you're doing in your lab, what is the big end goal uh, with your vision? Well, when I started out in grad school, I was doing uh, cellular neuroscience using the patch clamp technique where you're measuring from one neuron and just very in vitro, reduced preparation. And over the years, I've migrated to looking at like brain tissue and then whole animal experiments and then human experiments. We subcontract that to Duke University to, you know, uh, research where I'm actually the research subject, like on a NASA space analog mission. So now we're really interested in transitioning the science to human application. And that could be performance application, which we're working on now, and also a clinical application of the new therapies and technologies that we're developing and have various patents on. Uh, so we're kind of, we really want to vet out and determine what works and then move that into uh, human clinical trials as fast as possible. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. All right, Dom, I want to kind of shift gears here and like talk about some business stuff, some entrepreneurial stuff. So, I mean, what are, what are some like entrepreneurial projects that you're working on currently right now, like aside from just like researching and doing all that type of stuff in the lab? Yeah, I would say my wife is, has a really strong entrepreneurial spirit, you know, because uh, she's an academic and she's a research uh, assistant professor at the university, but has a little more time to do some of the, the business stuff. So we have a website, ketonutrition.org, where we develop content and we don't sell any products there, but we, we, we put out a lot of free content and then various companies that develop products that we like, we love to test them. And I'll test them with a continuous glucose monitor. I'll do blood work and things like that. And then we put some of those products on the, uh, the website. Sometimes the companies will give, give us an affiliate link. Mm -hmm. And uh, from affiliate income, we can actually you know, fund some of the research that we do. Uh, so that, that's been kind of cool. And uh, you know, so that's Keto Nutrition. And then Ketone Technologies is a company that we have where 
we work with our university to license out different patents and technologies that would be of interest to us. And, you know, and some of those things, you know, one of the things that we have now is the, the effects of using ketones to prevent uh, toxicity from various gases. So we're doing some research on that and uh, ketone technologies also is involved in consulting and we also do a lot of research and development and we support, support uh, research with government organizations like uh, with DARPA and with NASA. And, and this is really to just what I was talking about, about moving the science into uh, what we call operational performance. So an operational performance could be like a warfighter, it could be uh, an astronaut, it could be an aquanaut. If you work underwater and you stay in a water environment and work, you become an aquanaut. My wife and I are both aquanauts. Uh, so ketone technologies is really, uh, uh, you know, interest. we're in the research and development phase now, but we would like to ultimately develop and commercialize different products and technologies that can be incorporated into, uh, you know, different operational settings. And that's kind of what we're focusing on. So that's ketone technologies. And then keto, keto nutrition is more like the layman's person. Like I break down the science. Um, and then we have products. I have consultants on there. And I just try to inform everybody as much as possible on the science that we're doing. Yeah, I saw your guys' site before um, uh, that we put to, put together these questions. And man, you guys got some really great stuff like on that site. So it's a really good like resource and hub for anybody that wants to go on there and kind of learn more about what's going on with the latest research on ketogenic diets and supplements. So you guys are doing some great stuff there. Thank you. I appreciate it. I got to thank my uh, assistant, Christy, uh, and some of the, the students in my lab. They do a lot of work on helping with the blog and putting together articles. Uh, one of my former PhD students, Andrew Kutnick, is a power lifter, and uh, he's also, he did the research to show ketone bodies have an anti-catabolic effect. And as a type one diabetic, he has a very interesting story because he uses a low carb ketogenic approach to manage his type one diabetes. And uh, he actually gave a, a TEDx talk, you know, talking about uh, using low carb for type one diabetes, which was unheard of, you know, just a, a few years ago. So he's kind of a pioneer in that space. And the students that work under me in the lab are very passionate about, about nutrition as medicine. And I think that inspires and plays a very big role in the success of our lab you know, over the last decade. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it sounds like you put together like a, an A team around you. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Yeah. Uh, they just happen to come to me. You know, it's like uh, I keep an eye out for them, but the right students just came to me at the right time. And uh, I really have to give them much of the credit because they're in the trenches. They're doing yeah. the work day in and day out. And, uh, and they're all super hard workers and super smart. So, yeah, that's amazing. That's just one, that's one thing we advocate too. I mean, our, our mentors told us early on, like guys, you have to have like an A team around you and delegate certain tasks, like strengths and weaknesses, just really be self-aware with that. So it's, it's good to see that you guys are doing that. And then, I mean, you, like you said, they're in the trenches, they're getting their hands dirty. They're learning all these different things. And yeah. So my, my question too, Dom is like, what's, what's something that you've learned just like through just being an entrepreneur, like this last decade, that's like just something that's just every, every person should know if they are an aspiring entrepreneur going forward. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of like a, a entrepreneur in training, but <laughs> what I've you know <laughs> observed is that uh, really don't think about the money stream. Just think about mm -hmm. what, what kind of value can I give and, and what's the market? Try to understand the market as much as possible. And you can't do everything, but you want to take your, the thing that you have the highest expertise on and the research and, you know, your, and just encompass that focus on developing something that could be content, that could be uh, a scientific experiment, or it could be a product and to develop that in a way that gives value to the people who are interested in that, that particular expertise. And so I try not to stray too far. I get interested in things like, you know, working on the farm and, and that may become part of what we're doing too, mm -hmm. uh, developing food sources that yeah. are, you know, definitely like no GMO organic. We're like cleaning up our farm now and building up the soil, uh, you know, very, very interested in, 
you know, advocating for regenerative farming. That's something that we want to do. And I'm interested in that, but I really want to focus on sort of the, the bread and butter, which is this idea of changing your metabolic physiology for therapeutic purposes, but also from a lifestyle perspective too. So I think, I think from an entrepreneurial perspective, not to try to delve into too many things, but you know, know your one thing and focus on that and focus on it in a way that gives value to the people who are following it. Love yeah. it. Yeah, that's great. And would you say some of your students, like they, they kind of have that issue of just like not knowing what to do, you know, as far as like getting themselves out there content wise, or, you know, even starting a little like side hustle with consulting or coaching or something like that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I would say the students under me actually have a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think one thing that I'm fortunate is that I, I've been a pretty good connector with, with people and, uh, and I think when I was in the lab doing my PhD, I didn't have any distractions. I just had my experiments. So I should have actually finished in like three years, but it took me like five or six years. Uh, anyway, that's another story. But I think nowadays, like I wasn't even online back then. I mean, we barely just had the internet. It was just starting up, you know, 25 years ago when I was in college. Uh, so yeah, I think it's become a real problem for, for students. And my students are, they're, I'm very lucky in that they're very focused, but I've seen a, a lot of other graduate students, you know, just lose focus. And there's just so much enticing opportunities. Um, and grad school doesn't pay that much, right? So, uh, and, and just there's just so much content, a lot of good content, and a lot of distractions out there. Yeah. So I think it's important for like a mentor to touch base with and have it just kind of go around the table, so to speak, and figure out what everyone's been doing and to try to do, you know, keep them on track as much as possible. Luckily, my, my crew is very motivated on their particular projects. But, uh, but yeah, I think the problem is that they, they could have so many great opportunities it's hard for them when you're a PhD student, you really have to focus on your narrow project to get mm -hmm. done. Uh, and then opportunities, you can take advantage of them later on. And yeah. I tend to dabble in too many things as yeah, we all do. a faculty <laughs> member, member. And uh, you know, maybe I have to just throttle back a little bit and focus a little bit more on like the one thing. But, uh, but those opportunities have, have really you know, helped me out a lot too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, you actually mentioned mentors too. Like, was there any key mentors like that, you know, played pivotal roles like in your success? I mean, I, I know you had, you got coached by Lane too, right? At yeah, one point? yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I would yeah. consider Lane a, a, a mentor for sure. Like, I guess we knew each other 2007, 2008. I remember, I think we roomed together at an experimental biology meeting. Uh, and we've been very good friends ever since. Uh, we have a little bit different views about, you know, optimal nutrition and things like that. But it's like, I think we agree on 99% of the things. Uh, people think we disagree, but actually we agree and uh, super smart. And when I got into bodybuilding, you know, just from a recreational perspective, uh, and I, the more I studied the content that he was putting out there and what he was advocating, uh, it made a lot of sense. And at the time on bodybuilding.com, there was guys like Paul Revelia and uh, Eric Helms. I think you guys had him on there. You know, there was like this core crew back in like 2006, seven and eight that were super, super active on bodybuilding.com. And I learned from everyone, but Lane was like, you know, the key person there that everyone was watching and following the content coming up. So he lives, you know, near me here and, uh, you know, we're, we're maintained great friends, uh, but probably a guy who had equal or maybe even more influence just from, you know, a pure like bodybuilding perspective was uh, there's a, a Ronald Coleman that you might not have, there's Ron Coleman and then yeah. there's a Ronald <laughs> Coleman uh, who actually is an IFBB pro and won the team universe uh, before Skip LaCour won it and then Jeff Willett. Uh, and he was a very early mentor to me, a spiritual mentor, but also sort of a mentor from like, uh, a training perspective about how to train and not get hurt and how to hit your, uh, I guess our power went out here, uh, <laughs> and how to hit your, uh, you know, your bodies from different angles and stuff. So Ronald Coleman, uh, IFBB pro, not to be f confused with Ron Coleman, I think his nickname was Alcatraz. Um, and 
uh, yeah, just, you know, those, those people. And then I had a lot of academic mentors along the way. And, uh, you know, Professor J. Dean, who's still my colleague here, uh, is the reason I was able to take this academic path and, and go this route. Um, but yeah, mentors are really, really key. So I would encourage your listeners out there to identify people who are where you want to go and learn from them and you're going to get there faster for sure uh instead of trying to reinvent the wheel right and don't be you know i was kind of a shy uh introverted person but from the perspective of identifying mentors i think a good aspect of my personality was that i would really latch on to mentors and just try to probe to get as much information as possible and usually people are pretty uh you know, enthusiastic to talk about themselves and what they're doing, and in most cases, in, in helping other people too. And I try to do the same too, because a lot of uh, undergrad students come to me, and I try to give them as much time as possible. It's not always possible to talk to everybody, but I try to do the same thing that uh, you know my mentors did for me: is just give them the time. That's the most valuable asset we have. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something we advocate to people too. Is just you know hire mentors, expedite the learning curve, and just man, uh, our mentors were huge. Uh, you know, pivotal. Just like you know, just during our time and just you know, our success. Just still, we still continue to seek out mentors. And you know, sh- shout out to Lane Norton. I mean, he was one of them as well too. So, great, great guy. So, Don, let's let's transition into lifestyle because that is the name of this podcast, the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. So, we're really, really interested in people's day to day lives. And I know you said most of the time you're in the lab, you're researching, and then you're on your farm. So, give us a day in the life of Dom D'Agostino. Okay. Uh, well, I wake up usually about an hour or two before my wife, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I still get about seven hours sleep. And, you know, first thing I do is just drink a big glass of water. I get the water brewing for the coffee for my French press and uh, get the dog's food already. Although I le- don't let them out because I really like to have an hour of, to hour and a half of peace and quiet to myself. Yeah. A lot of times it's still usually a little bit dark. And uh, yeah, the first thing I do actually, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a spiritual person and I, I, I read scripture for like the first maybe 30 minutes. And then I, I read particular passages in, in scripture, and then I, I will journal on that. And that really sets the, you know, the, the tone, uh, the motivation, and the momentum for the day. And, uh, and after I do that, I look at my, uh, my planner, and I, I write down all the things that need to be done, and then I put stars next to things that are non-negotiable. I mean, that stars that at the end of the day, these things need to be done. And one of the things on there that I always have is creative downtime, right? Because uh, if I don't schedule, I get so passionate and so involved with my work that if I do not actually schedule in uh, downtime, like with my wife, with the dogs, where we just kind of just go out and just be together and not have anything in particular to do, right? Uh, for that, we typically do walks and we talk about our day and things like that, uh, or just kind of just hang out. Uh, so I think that's, that's like super important to get the work stuff out of the way, uh, frame it in the morning, get the work stuff out of the way and, uh, and allocate, you know, that creative downtime could come in the morning, afternoon or evening or whatever. Uh, but I think it is an important aspect of, of what I do. And I try to now, nowadays with COVID, I do most of. I come into the lab about two or three times a week, but when I'm working from home, it's pretty nice because I can work a little bit and then do a little bit of work outside, you know, jump at the pool, get back to my desk <laughs> and do things, get, get power back on. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I think I'm fortunate in that, you know, I have a home office, I have a gym at home in the nice. barn and uh, nice. I have all my weights there, everything that I need. I just do like very basic training. So, uh, and to break up the monotony, a lot of times I just, I've been doing just like one exercise, main focus exercise per day. Uh, I've always trained just like three times a week, but I've been trying to train like pretty much every day, uh, unless I have a pretty brutal workout, but it's like super short. My workouts have always been super short, like 15 to 30 minutes, Mm. but it'll be a particular body part. And, um, and 
I try to break it up like that. And I do a lot of work outside that I call active recovery. Yeah. So it's, it's lifting things on the farm, doing moving your body. Mm-hmm. And on days that like the day after training heavy and I'm a little bit sore, that active recovery really facilitates uh, recovery. I think just, just getting your body yeah. moving and mm-hmm. uh, as long as it's not too strenuous. So. Yeah. So, so like, for example, like, um, you, one of those like exercises you focus on for like 20 minutes, like, for example, you'll do like maybe like a deadlift and then kind of just do like high volume on that. Or like, I, I'm, I'm just curious. Cause it's kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, what did I do? Oh, yesterday I tweaked my back out. Uh, I was actually swinging an ax. I was, I was chopping up stumps on my, with an ax and, uh, I, kind of tore a lower back muscle about a week or so ago. So I was going to do bent rows yesterday, but I did one arm rows and I have an Olympic set of dumbbells where I can even put like the 45s on if I have to. Uh, So the only exercise I did that day, and I can support myself to not re-injure my lower back, was one arm rows. And I did three or four sets, I think, in each hand. And that was it. And I was power washing the barn and I just took it started pouring rain. So I went inside the barn and I did 15 minutes and now I'm pretty sore uh, today. Or yeah, and today I will actually do, I've been using the hex bar a lot or the trap bar. Yeah. And uh, there's a guy that I'm friends with on Facebook. He said he'd give me a thousand dollars if I could uh, <clears throat> and put it towards my research. If I could clean uh, 315, 345s on each side get back into the incline position and press it five times. So uh, my lower back is not recovered enough to be able to clean that up because it's pretty hard, but I think I can press it. So today I'm going to work on hex bar incline presses. And uh, I'm glad he challenged me to do that because using a neutral grip on pressing is like a game changer for my shoulder. Yeah. So, uh, So now it's like one of my new favorite exercises is actually like overhead presses with the hex bar or like incline presses with the mm-hmm. hex bar and my shoulders are kind of thanking me for that so yeah. well, uh, i try to do a lot of variation yeah well that's awesome man like if you uh, end up getting to doing that uh <laughs> that bet then put that on video and then tag us <laughs> i will I, I usually i will post it to instagram yeah. but i will have it you know post on twitter and facebook too hopefully within the next week I'll be able to do it. I'm going to do a strength test today. And if I'm good enough to press it up, then I think in about a week, I'll be able to clean it up and get it in, in position. Yeah. So, nice. All right, Dom. So we're, we're coming to an end on this, uh, this awesome conversation that we've had with you and super grateful for this. And before I ask the last question, I just want to commend you and just um, tell you just all the stuff that you're doing is really, really awesome. I know we met like five years ago at the ISN conference in Clearwater, Florida. So, you know, I've been trying to get you on the show for a long time. I know you're a busy guy and you've made great appearances like on the Joe Rogan podcast, um, Tim Ferriss show. So kudos to you on that and just everything you guys are doing in your guys' lab uh, to make the world a better place with health and wellness. So, you know, I just want to commend you on that. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on too. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it took so long to get on. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> More to talk so, about. Yeah. So Dom, what does living a dynamic lifestyle mean to you? Uh, it means a lot of things. Uh, I think, you know, the, the situation we're in now with COVID-19 has really forced us to get out of our comfort zone in some ways. So I think, you know, it's the timing to be more dynamic than ever. So what you guys are promoting and putting out there uh, and the different people that you put on uh, or have on the show, uh, your, your listeners can, can take away from each of them and actually put that into actionable. There's a lot of actionable takeaways there. So uh, in one way, I guess I've been <laughs> dynamic is that I saw this negative situation as a, a lot of opportunity. And I think the people who are doing well now and I really feel for people who have gotten COVID-19 or have a family member or you know, who's died from it. I know this has affected a lot of people from a, a negative health consequences, but also from a business perspective. But I think, um, I think everybody can look at a situation. And I had a mentor that always said, whenever something negative happens, always think, how can I leverage this? Mm-hmm. You know, he'd always say that, and he is very high up in the military. Uh, and did a great job at, at doing that. And, uh, and I think that's what we have to do. And I think that's part of being a dynamic person is to look at a situation 
And if it's uh, if you look at it as a setback, it's going to be a setback. But if you look at it as an opportunity that you can leverage, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that you can do that. And all the entrepreneurs out there can do that. Even from, you know, uh, I've had injuries before, and then I refocus on a weak point, and actually end up a lot stronger because, you know, after letting an injury repair itself for for like a couple months or something. I've never really had any serious injuries, so I'm super lucky, but we can always leverage um, a setback or a, a bad situation. Yeah. So I guess that would be like my main kind of takeaway. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Powerful and uh, absolutely agree 100% on that. So Dom, where can, um, you know, is there anything we could support you on particular right now? And where can the listeners go find out more information about yourself and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I appreciate you, you offering that. Yeah. Uh, I try to compile everything on ketonutrition.org. So uh, ketonutrition.org. And, uh, and also from a, some of our business stuff is ketonetechnologies.com. Uh, but keto, uh, follow me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. And maybe if you guys have, could post those you know, profile links on, on this when it comes out. Uh, but I pretty much put most of my time and effort as far as content on keto nutrition and also sign up for the newsletter because I try to put fresh content in, you know, a newsletter went out this morning and it's just like the stuff, you know, I was doing all week, you know, experiments, products I reviewed, things like that. So it's always like the latest science, the latest cool products that are out. Uh, when this podcast comes out, I'll put it in a newsletter, you know, and send it out. So those things really help me a lot. You know, the more subscribers and people I have following me, the more, uh, the information and get out there to people. Yeah. I you know, appreciate that. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll have all that linked up in the show notes. So once again, Dom D'Augustino, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom. Guys, make sure you guys go follow Dom and all his cool stuff that he's doing. So until next time. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video and another episode on pro tips on living a dynamic lifestyle. We truly appreciate it. Hopefully you got a lot of value out of it. If you're interested in getting more value like this from these pro tips, make sure to subscribe above. We're going to be dropping these daily. Also, if you are a fitness professional and you're looking to create more income, impact, influence, and independence, we just dropped our new book, Rise of the Fit Pros, so you guys can do all of that. And you can also start building your hybrid training model of in-person and online training. So make sure to click the link or the book right here to grab your guys' copy and we'll send it over to you. Other than that, we're out. Talk to you soon.